Okay, so the second speaker for tonight will be uh, Professor George Ellis. So whose talk topic is entitled as the basic mechanisms of downward causation that allow causal emergence. So let me just briefly introduce the Professor George Ellis. The George Ellis is the emeritus distinguished professor of complex systems in the Department of Mathematics and Applied Mathematics at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. So he's also the past president of the International Society for Science and Radigan. So let's welcome the professor, uh, George Elias, for his amazing talk. Now, this talk is going to be very different from the past last one. It's a very conceptual rather than a very um, computational talk. So I want to talk about the basic mechanisms of downward causation that allow causal emergence. And <clears throat> Emergence of complex systems, genuine complexity, always takes place by a modular hierarchical structures where every single word is very important. So this refers to life, digital computers, aircraft, cities, and so on. Now, also they are adaptive. They all respond to the environment. They're modular. They're made up of semi-autonomous parts and they're hierarchical. They have many emergent levels and each emergent level has quite a different nature. And their functioning is based in structures. So uh, um, in, in, in our bodies, for instance, our eyes enable us to see, uh, in an aircraft, a wing enables it to fly and so on. And so each function is enabled by some kind of physical structure. Now you have this hierarchy and there are different descriptions variables and effective laws that apply at each emergent level. And the famous uh, solid state physicist, Bill Anderson, wrote about this in some depth. And in the emergent hierarchy, every level is needed for the whole to work. They are all equally important. And my colleague, Dennis Noble, has written about that. So here's a basic hierarchy. The physical basis is atoms. Uh, then you get molecules. Then you get the basic level of life. The basic level of life is cells, which is the first level where you actually have living reproduction taking place. Then you get these make up tissues. These make up organs. These make up organs and body systems. And that gives you the organism, which is the basic emergent entities of life, which are autonomous. These comprise populations and communities and ecosystems, and these each act down to give context for the development of organisms, because organisms don't exist on their own. They exist as a member of a population, community, and ecosystem. So that's the basic hierarchy of biology in a pictorial form. Here it is in a more abstract form. You have particles, atoms, chemistry, biochemistry, cell biology, neurology, <laughs> botany, zoology, physiology, psychology, <clears throat> and above that, sociology, economics, and politics. And there are different descriptions and variables and effective laws at each emergent level. So you can study each of these levels. You can get laws of, of, of that happen at each level. So you can get biochemistry laws, chemistry laws, cell biology laws, physiology laws, and so on. Here is the case of the central nervous system, uh, molecules, one angstrom, synapses, ne neurons, networks, maps, systems, and the central nervous system. And again, there is functioning which takes place at each level, and the kind of function that takes place at each level is very different from the functions below. So you get a real emergence that happens. So modular hierarchical structure here enables function at each level uh, to emerge via the structuring. Now, why modular hierarchical structures? Why, firstly, why structures? Well, because that's how function emerges, as I've already mentioned. Why modular? The basic principle is you break up a complex task into simpler tasks. You design modules to handle them, and then you merge the outcomes of the modules to complete the complex task. 
Now, what this allows is abstraction and information hiding and encapsulation. What this means, Grady Booch has written about that, you don't need outside the module to know what's happening inside the module. You can hide the information of the internal dynamics and you can represent the module by an abstract description which relates information to output, the way it behaves as a black box. But because it's a module, you don't need the to know the dynamics of the inside. So that's encapsulation. The internal dynamics is encapsulated. This enables evolutionary development with inheritance. So in, in evolution, and in fact, in most cases where a modular hierarchical system exists, they have emerged from previous hierarchical systems through some evolutionary process in which the same modules occur in the later version, but with some variation, but inheriting properties of the previous module. And in fact, the Nobel Prize winner Herbert Simon has said this is the only way it's possible to develop a truly complex system. Why hierarchical? Well, hierarchical naturally emerges when you combine molecules. Each level handles different kind of tasks supporting the other levels. And for details of abstraction information hiding, you need to go to the place where human beings themselves have succeeded in creating systems of that kind, and that's in computer science. And so this is a wonderful book about all of this, Grady Booch, a book called Object-Oriented Analysis and Design, talking about how if you're designing a computer principle system, you use all of these principles in the case of computation. In fact, if you're uh, building a very complex structure like an aircraft, you also use all these principles, and biology has used all of these principles to enable biological evolution. And by the way, organizations, a really big organization, if you've got an organization with tens of thousands of <clears throat> employees, you need something like this as well. Now, key point about biology, which is my main concern, vast numbers of and, and our biology, the emergence of life arises out of vast numbers of atoms and molecules. Number of cells in the human body is 10 to the 13. Now, this is not an obvious statement. It took us a very long time to understand that the body was made up out of cells. The number of proteins in a cell is 42 million. The number of atoms in a cell is 10 to the 14th. Now, the existence of atoms is also not obvious. And in fact, physicists, well, philosophers and physicists argued about the existence of atoms for thousands of years. Even Max Planck doubted the existence of atoms. So you've got the, the vast number of atoms in a civic in a cell, 10 to the 14, the number of cells in the body, 10 to the 13. So 10 to the 27 atoms in a human, incredibly large numbers. None of this is obvious. It took centuries to prove it. Now, next point is there's a dynamic content. The oxygen nitrogen molecules in air at normal room temperature are moving at between 300 to 400 meters per second. A biomolecule collides 10 to the 13th times a second with water molecules. So don't get put off by pictures of cells and molecules as if they are static objects. Everything is in dynamic interaction all the time. Now, same level causation emerges at every level via upwards and downwards causation. This is my second major point. So same level causation happens at every level, which my colleague Dennis Noble has emphasized very much, and it's linked by upward emergence and downward effects. These together, the upward and downward emergence, enable same level effective laws to emerge at every level that characterize the dynamics of those levels. And for the philosophers, if you're worried about philosophy, causation and the way I'm talking about means difference making. You can either make a real difference and see the results that happen. You can make an experimental difference and check that it causes a difference, or you can counterfactually do it. You can work out a theory which shows that if you made a difference at one level, it would cause difference at other levels. So causation is difference making. Okay, here we have particles, atoms, chemistry, et cetera, and there's upward causation. Microphysics underlies macrophysics, such as in the kinetic theory of gases. Physics underlies chemistry via the periodic table of elements, and the way this happens was one of the wonderful discoveries of quantum chemistry. 
Molecules underlie cell biology, proteins, RNA, DNA, the great discoveries of molecular biology last century. Cells underlie all of life. Every living thing is made up out of millions, billions of cells. And physics and molecular cellular biology underlie neuroscience, again, one of the great discoveries of the last century. So that's the upward causation. But downward causation also takes place. Developmental processes determine what happens in cell biology. So in cell biology, you get different kinds of cells, skin, hair, blood, uh, neurons, and so on. And which cell occurs where is determined downwardly by its position in the organization by developmental processes. I'll talk about this later. Cell processes control metabolism and gene regulation according to the higher level needs. The mind controls physiological events such as walking. I decide I'm going to go walking. Signals travel down to the to my muscles, to the basically to the electrons in my muscle. Thoughts initiate motions of electrons and atoms in muscle fibers. If this wasn't the case, you wouldn't be able to walk. So downward causation is taking place. Now, a key feature of downward causation is multiple realization. A higher level kind of action like the thought that I'm going to walk is not the same as any as 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 as, as, as the lower level realization because they can be realized in huge numbers of ways at lower level because of these vast numbers. So multiple realizability means when you're uh, going to achieve a higher level purpose, the details at the lower level doesn't matter, the emergent structures do. What matters is the emergent level like a cell it must have all the components of the cell as ranges required for cellular function, and that's very, very complex. The detailed positions of molecules in the cell does not matter as long as they make up the components, the mitochondria, the nucleus, and all of that. So you have a level one function. It can be re realized at the lower level L2 in many, many different ways. And it doesn't matter which of these lower level ways is used to realize the higher level function. There's billions of possible realizations at the molecular level, all fulfilling the same higher level functions. For instance, in terms of sight, at this level, an eye can see. That's the function which must be attained. At level two, there can be a set one of molecules or set two of molecules or set sets. There are billions and billions of possible arrangement of molecules at the molecular level, which create an eye which will work at the <clears throat> emergent physiological level. You can re-describe the eye <coughs> at this level, but it's not a natural kind. It misses the essential function. If you're going to re-describe it at this level, you have to say this or this or this or this, and you have to repeat that billions of times in order to get the statement, the eye enables you to see. So multiple realizability is crucial to real emergence. Now, there are two basic kinds of downward causation. I'm going to spend a bit of time on the first mechanism, which is time-dependent constraints. And examples are going to be homeostasis, feedback control, and neural networks, the basis of the nervous system and learning. And again, causation is difference-making. So the first me uh, mechanism is high-level constraints constrain what happens at lower levels. And because they're time-dependent, they can make the lower level do what the higher level needs. So constraints underlie feedback control, which is homeostasis. A control loop is enabled by structures and it gives you a cybernetic system, which is what it's called in engineering and biology, it's called homeostasis. So here's a basic thing. You have a system and you want a desired state. You have goals for that state. You have a comparator which checks them. If there's an error you send a message to the controller, that changes the situation of the state, and then you compare it again, and you go round and round the loop until the system state corresponds to the goals. Information flows around con specifically constructed feedback loops. They are physically constructed, and a classic example is a thermostat for a room. The goal is the chosen temperature T. Contextually determined branching behavior emerges if the temperature is less than the desired. Sorry. This should be T naught. T naught then apply heat, else do not apply heat. And so this is the con contextual branching which emerges out of the structure. If the temperature is less than the emergence when you apply heat, if it isn't, you don't. And so 
the physics at together with this emergent structure has enabled this branching to emerge. And this structure is the central principle in engineering, biology, and in society. So here's an air conditioning thermostat. This is the structure by which you determine if the electricity should go on or not. And there's a whole lot of mechanical details in there. This is the digital setting whereby you control that. You set your goals there, 76 degrees, and that determines how fast the molecules will move in the room because if it's too low, this turns on the heater, turns on the heat, and that causes molecules to move at a different speed. So that's downward causation. The high level structure, which we've just been looking at, shapes the outcomes. It's causation due to this emergent structure. If you break the loop, it won't work, even though all the parts are there. It's the topology that matters. If you think of that loop before, if you have all of the parts, but you simply disconnect one of the wires, the thing won't work. So the system is connected so as to give the outcome. That's the nature of an emergent structure. The whole is more than the sum of the parts. It has organization between its parts, which gives this resultant behavior. And an interesting thing, if you swap the terminals on this, things so that the sign of the error signal has changed, then there will be a different outcome. So in fact, the system will burn itself out. That's because you've changed the topology of the system. You've changed the emergence structure in a crucial way, and the downward causation will then result in the, uh, in the heater element getting burnt. Bodily stability is enabled by homeostasis. It enables blood, bodily temperature, blood pressure, heart rate, transport across cell membranes, cell membranes, resting potential in neurons. Each is governed by implicit goals embodied in the physical structure of the body. They enable the body to, the organism to maintain itself and that costs energy. The human body has literally thousands of control systems in it. How did these come into being through the process of natural selection, adapting our bodies to the environment at all the time? So in the human body, these are all crucial systems. You're ill if they're not working, and they came into existence through natural selection. Our next example is neural networks. And you know about the basic idea. You have a neuron, a dendrite, a nuclear cell body axon. Connected neutrons make a network. The networks make up the brain. And ne the neurons channel electric signals to others via synapses. Now, this constrains the signal to go from there to there along there. The signal doesn't go sideways, it goes along there. So that's a constraint, which is constraining how the electrons move. <clears throat> the, the, the network is constraining them that this one is connected to that one, this one's connected to that one, because that's the way they're connected by the network. Memory and thoughts arise from the details of the connections between the neurons. The physical form of each of our brains are connection patterns distinguishes each of us from the other one. So the, 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 this structure constrains the electrons and action potentials to flow in ways which are different in me and you. They're determined by all the forms of brain plasticity. As we interact with the world, uh, these are all shaped to reflect our behavior and, and, and our understandings, and that then determines how the brain functions. Now, Spike chains are enabled by ion flow. So here's a bit more detail. Here's a bit more of a look at a neuron. You've got your dendrites, you've got your nucleus, you've got your axons, and you've got a synapse over here where it goes from one to the other, and then it does the same down here. Net there are neutrons, uh, networks of cells, neurons, each with this same structure. Now, what happens here is information flows along the axons and information flows in the form of action potential spike chains. That's a voltage, it's in spikes, and the information is coded in these spike chains. So the voltage goes up and down, it gives you a spike chain which travels along here, travels along here, and then across to the next one. The information flows through constrained motions of electrons. They're constrained by having to flow through the, 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 the axons, from the dendrites to the nuclear axons and onto other ones by the synapses. Note, we do not know how specific thoughts are encoded by the spike chains. We know that our specific thoughts are encoded in these spike chains, but we don't know how specific thoughts are. Now, 
The key point I'm going to go to is that the, 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 this flow is enabled by sodium and potassium ions flowing in and out of the cell wall. And that's how this works at the microscopic level. So an ion channel, a protein controls ion flow across the walls. Now here's a voltage gated ion channel when it's closed and here is when it's open. This is the cell exterior, sorry, this is the exterior, here's the interior. So if the voltage gradient is upward, <coughs> because you've got a plus there and a minus there, the channel is closed. And then the sodium can't come in. If the voltage gradient is downward, it's plus there and minus there, the gate is open and the sodium can come in. So this, <coughs> this condition, this, the, the, this, the, the, this, this external um, condition, the upwards or the downwards uh, uh, voltage, changes this constraint from being closed to being open and it enables the ions from not being able to go through, it enables them to go through. And this again enables logic to emerge from the underlying physics. You change the shape and what you get, if upward then channel closed, if downward then channel open. So this is a crucial way in biology whereby logic emerges from the underlying chemistry, which depends on the underlying physics. Such contextual logical branching, something like this is a key feature of biology at every level. Let's go down and look at this at one level more. It's enabled by time dependent constraints. The context changes with times. The context here is upwards and here it's downwards. So that's a time dependent constraint. Now, this is enabled by molecular structure. And in, in fact, these, these things we were just looking at, that's a voltage gated ion channel. This is how it looks at the molecular level. This is the side view when it's closed. And this is a top view when it is open. And here you can see that this there is the iron going through because it's open. These are four panels, which we see from the side. These are the same four panels seen from the top. And here they're closed, but they can go open. So these flip sideways or close depending on the voltage across it. And here they are open and therefore the iron can go through. The key is the changing shape. It changes from these being closed like that to these flipping sideways to being open of the protein ion channels, responding to the electric voltage across the cell wall. Now, the ion channel is a much larger scale than the ion. There's the ion, and this channel is a much larger scale. So this is downward causation from the scale of the ion channel to the scale of the ion. So that's a case of contextual time-dependent Diamond causation. And this is the way all molecular biology works. It's the ch change of shape of these molecules which causes the logic that happens and underlies all biological developments at higher levels. The downward control of ion flows arises by change of molecular shape. These, where did these molecules come from? They came into existence by evolutionary selection. This is an extraordinary complicated structure and it couldn't possibly have just randomly assemble itself. It came into shape, shape with this shape because it served a biological purpose and evolution discovered that and reproduced the DNA which would produce this shape. So the second mechanism, I've talked now about constraints. The second major mechanism down causation is creating, changing or deleting lower level elements. And we've just looked at an example of that. And this is, happens via gene regulatory networks and metabolic networks. We just heard a bit about that. And by developmental processes determining cell types and by natural selection adapting molecules and uh, to the environment. So in this way, higher levels have causal power over le lower levels by altering the constitutional entities. And this is one of the major ways that biology is completely different from the kinetic theory of gases and physics. In the kinetic theory of gases, the particles remain the same and not affected in any way by the interaction that takes place. This is quite the opposite to biology at the molecular biology level. It's a major, major difference. So it's down causation by changing, creating, changing, deleting lower level elements. And again, causation is difference making. So we do not just have invariantly 
functioning parts assembled in different ways and operating in different contexts. The nature of the parts, the way they function, is affected by context in a top-down way because they are adapted to these functions. So cells, through development of biology, become different at different places in the body. For instance, neurons occur in some places, sorry, uh, skeletal cells in other places, cardiac cells in other places. So the cells in biology are fitted to where they are in the organism. That's one example. Biomolecules with specific functions come into place through um, genetics, hemoglobin, voltage, ATP, ion channels. How do those come into being? Through DNA coding the information to create them. And so that's where they came into being. That's the process whereby they came into being. And just a organizational example, students in the university are shaped for specific roles in society by the action of the university. They're shaped to become scientists, engineers, doctors, because society needs those. And this is society acting in a downward way to create the elements of society, namely the, the, these people in, in, in the way they would be. So a student enters the university, they don't have any of their capacity. They're shaped by the university into becoming these components that society needs. This is the analogy in society of how this works. So the first example is the famous example of the fly. And you start off with the embryo with parasegnaments and can, positional information determines, the, here determines gene expression, which determines specific proteins, which determine developmental outcomes. And so at, you start off, these are all the same, but then positional information gets different genes going in different places, different proteins in different places. And that results in eyes here, the wings here, the, the legs there, and all of these segments there. And everything takes place in a segmental way. And so this is, and what happens is there's localized gene expression. This gene is expressed in this way spatially. This gene is expressed this way spatially. This gene is expressed this way spatially and this one this way spatially. So, and so this one, for in, instance, is expressed there. It's a dominant gene there. That then gives you the segment properties. And that's what results in the different, in, in the way that that embryo develops into the adult thing. And so the elements, namely the cells, are changed into different kinds of cells, which would result in different uh, emergent properties as you saw in the case of the fly. So you, you need these different emergent properties. It takes place by these different um, uh, uh, factors, gene expressions, factors taking place. Genes are expressed differently in different places, and that's what happened. So the positional expression of genes leads to segments by determining what components, what cells exist where. So this is another very important example, the core of developmental biology. Okay, the general process of adaptive selection, which underlies all of this, is that meaningful information is gained by discarding all the information stuff received that's not meaningful. And so adaptive selection, and we're going to look at the example of evolution in a minute, the general process underlying how you get preferred units out of a mess, you have a disordered mess here, an ensemble of stuff, and you want to select the ones that you want, the process I'm talking about. You want to get order out of disorder. So you have a selective gate, a selective criterion, which gets the chosen stuff <coughs> out of the stuff you don't want. And this selective gate is, is, happens in some kind of way, very much depending on the context. And so, but the, the logic is if X is in the, obeys the selective criterion, then keep it and let it through. If it's not in C, that's the else, then delete it and don't let it through. And this is the basic logic of adaptive selection, which occurs throughout biology. An example in our lives, deleting unwanting emails. You've got a whole mass of emails coming in. You've got your own criteria about what is meaningful, what isn't. You delete the ones you don't want. You let through the ones you do. And that's how adaptive selection enables you to get the emails you want. So in your computer files, the, the, the things that you want to work on, the components you want to work on at the later time are the ones you do want are selected in this way from the ones that you don't want. And that's how adaptive selection works in that context. 
The selective nature of vision takes place via predictive processing. And this is a very interesting topic. I won't go into more, but our eyes receive huge amount of information all the time. And we have processes in our brain where we learn to ignore all the background information, which is irrelevant because it's not changing. And we learn to, our brain is structured so as to make us see, literally to see something which is important, like a threatening figure coming towards us. And so you choose the parts of the scene that you see, uh, the brain chooses it for you, and you literally don't see the other one because you just take it for granted and you don't even notice it. You ignore vast amounts of background information in order to focus on what is relevant. Now, the key place where natural selection takes place is evolution, and here's a polar bear, and the environment is white. It's good for this bear to be white so it can get to its prey without being seen. So it's good for the animal to be white. And evolutionary processes basically determine that's a good idea, Darwinian processes. So it, that selects a DNA sequence, which will result in proteins, which will give it a white fur. So the white environment leads to white fur by selecting animals which will have DNA sequences that will lead to proteins which are white. And so this is an adaptive process from the environment to the gene to the gene regulator networks that will produce those white proteins. And this is a process whereby you select the elements at the lower level, which will give you the higher level result that you want. You want the protein to be selected so that the animal will be white and that process takes place. And so that's an example of what I'm talking about, that the elements at this level are selected for biological purpose. The biological purpose is camouflage. The selection principle is survival and reproduction. Is it top-down causation? Yes, a different environment. Consider a bear in the Canadian forest. You will get different genes and DNA because in that case, in the Canadian forest, you'll get a DNA sequence to produce proteins that will produce brown or black fur so that, that one can hunt well in the forest. So alter genes mean change materials to change proteins at the molecular level. And Donald Campbell wrote about how this is an example of downward causation. This is clearly a multi-level affair. Each level down below, the DNA sequence, the proteins is enabled to select ecological adaptation. So here's where the ecological adaptation takes place. That chains down to give you DNA sequences, to, which chain down to give the proteins you want. <coughs> and so this is an example of down causation to the protein level to give you what you want. Uh, the other I want to look at is again return to the network structure of the brain. I've talked about it. That kind of learning depends on the connection between the neurons. These structural relations form a network specified in addition to the properties of the neurons. It's connectivity properties, adjacency matrix, and nodes are, are determined by this. And we just heard a little bit about the importance of these things. So different connections will give different outputs. Personality and abilities are determined by this network structure and its motifs. So how does this come into existence? And the basic point is the following, and this is from Walpert's book on development of biology, the birth of neurons. Here's some neurons and here's some other ones. They take place randomly. Then they outgrow axons and dendrites through a growth cone, and they make connections randomly. And the reason they make place randomly is there's no developmental process which could precisely tell this to join with that one. So they send out random uh, uh, growths, random uh, axons and dendrites, and then these make random connections. So the initial set of relatively non-specific connections, non-specific because they didn't know better, they didn't know what particular ones they could connect to, they are refined to produce a precise pattern of connectivity. So some of them get chopped. You see here, there are a lot, here there are much fewer. They get refined, some are cut, the ones which are used a lot get strengthened. And so as you uh, <clears throat> look at things, the ones which are important, or the things that are important get strengthened, and the ones that don't uh, get matter get, uh, 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 get pruned. So this kind of refinement takes place in all processes involving neuroplasticity and learning, as Eric Kandel and Gerald Edelman have shown. It's shaped by the environment. It's shaped by how you interact with the environment. And this is an example in which these details 
start off random and then the ones that are important get selected. It's an example of that selection process I was talking about in the last slides. And what, what kinds of things shape it? Neural connections are shaped by personal mental experiences and by the environment. So here's an article about the social influences on neuroplasticity, stress and interventions to promote well-being by David and McEwen in Nature Neuroscience. Experiential factors shape the neural circuits underlying social and emotional behavior from the prenatal period to the end of life. This is the downward causation I'm talking about from the environment into those detailed connections. Structural and functional change in the brain have been disturbed with cognitive therapy and certain forms of meditation and lead to the suggestion that well-being and other pro-social characteristics might be enhanced through training. In other words, you can change your own connections by cognitive therapy and by meditation. And so this is the way that you can change, reach down to change your own neural connection. Actually, every time you learn anything, you're changing your neural connections. Um, if, if, you, if, you, if you read a textbook and you learn something, you're changing your neural connections. Those are specific cases. Okay, now, very important under this, I've emphasized that adaptivity requires stochasticity. Psychological emergence, abstract causation with the practice of science require the possibility of agency. However, many physicists and philosophers <coughs> claim that agency cannot take place because physics at the bottom level is causally closed. There is no room for down causation required for agency because then the lower levels would be overdetermined. And I'm sure you've heard that argument. This neglects the biological stochasticity which makes it possible. This stochasticity provides the openness needed for selection processes I've just discussed, which choose outcomes that satisfy higher level goals and values. So this is simulation of Brownian motion of a particle. These are dust particles, and there's a big particle, the red one, <laughs> and it moves with random velocities in different directions. The many body interactions that yield Brownian motion cannot be solved by a model accounting for every involved molecule. The only probabilistic models applied to molecular populations can be employed to describe it <coughs> because of the enormous number of bombardments of Brownian particle will undergo roughly 10 to the 14 collisions per second. And this is the context in which molecular emergence takes place. This is very important. There's an immense stochasticity in the cell, which means that predictably the outcome of that level is completely impractical, not just in practice, but in principle. Because with these huge number of collisions, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle prevents the initial data being determined at the molecular level at an accuracy that will allow price of precise enough predictions. Even if you had all the data, <coughs> you can't have it with infinite accuracy because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The pluses demon cannot even in principle know the initial data needed with sufficient accuracy to predict specific outcomes, in particular because chaotic dynamical systems occur in the real universe, for example, and weather patterns that affect our lives. So biology has discovered this, and <clears throat> this biology <coughs> uses the stochasticity to allow function. And Hoffman talks again about these, uh, these huge number of collisions. Molecular machines have been de designed by evolution. Kinesin and dynein are molecules that have come into existence they extract order from chaos, directed motion and function emergence. And Peter Hoffman's book, Life's Ratchet, How Molecular Machines Attract Order from Chaos, is a wonderful book about this. And again, we see now initially random neural connections get refined, learning takes place uh, as experience occurs and it gets refined. Again, biology is taking advantage of that initial randomness in order to give the connections that we want. So biological function emerges enabled by stochasticity. This enables choices between options at the lower level to fulfill higher level nodes. It frees biology from the iron group of physics. It allows higher levels to select desired outcomes and discard the rest. And that's a process of downward adaptive selection. So here's Dahanian walking along a molecule. This extraordinary molecule is powering itself by random connections and it's got a basically a ratchet, a one-way ratchet, which is extracting the order out 
of the random connections. The random connections are hitting this molecules in both directions, but the molecular structure of dynein extracts order from the underlying randomness. These have involved, in order to take place, kinesin and dynein extract that order and produce useful outcomes. And here is a ribosome, which again, if you just look at it, there's an immense amount of randomness taking place as it uses the randomness to assemble proteins in a reliable way. So at the molecular level, there's huge randomness. But what is reliable is the way that proteins are assembled by a ribosome. Level of order emerges from a level of disorder in this way. In this way, agency can arise in this way from the underlying physics. And here's a great paper on this. Can reasons and values influence action? Permite intentional agency work physiologically by Raymond and Dennis Noble, the Journal for the General Philosophy of Science 2020. Harnessing toxicity can be the basis of creative agency. Such harnessing can resolve the apparent conflict between reductionist micro-level accounts of behavior and behavior as the outcome of rational and value-driven macro-level decisions. Neurophysiological processes can instantiate such behavior, and we've been looking at that a little bit. The process involved depends on three features of living organisms. They are necessary open systems, which we've seen. They higher levels within lower levels. No levels to high level system and causal interactions must occur across the boundaries between the levels of organization. The higher levels constrain the dynamics of the lower levels. And so they claim, and you should read that paper if you want to, <clears throat> this is how intentional agency can work physiologically. And the final thing I want to talk about is cause of closure. Cause of closure for a minor brain only takes place if we include all the levels from the physical the Schrodinger-Dirac equation to the mental, where action decisions are made in based in social contexts and value choices are made. The higher level emotion processes of decision-making have a logic based in values and goals. We assess outcomes in the light of our wishes and we decide between them. This is the processes that take place at the psychological level. <clears throat> the physical level is not causally closed by itself. That's a myth. The laws of physics represent possibilities only, but the laws of physics by themselves do nothing whatever. If you have Maxwell's equations sitting there, they don't do anything until they're given a context. The exclusion problem over determination of lower levels, which some people claim, does not apply. So here's a very important example. Smoking causes lung cancer. At the socio, this is driven, smoking causes lung cancer, it's driven from the sociology and economics levels because advertisers spend a large sum of money, or they used to, promoting uh, smoking by advertising and social pressure promotes advertising. These advertising agents used to do a lot of research as to what kinds of adverts would make you be most likely to buy cigarettes. Your friends come and say, come on, help smoke. We're all doing it. Why don't you join us? There's social pressure. There's pressure from the sociology and economics levels to make you decide to smoke. This acts down to the individual psychological level where you think, I enjoy smoking. And here there's a battle between rationality and emotion. Rationality says, no, it's not a good idea. You might get cancer. Emotion says, but I enjoy doing it. I want to do it. And so you, you battle it out at this level. Supposing you decide you are going to smoke, this reaches down to the physiology level and it is an established causal fact. Smoking causes cancer. That's a causal relation which has been established in detail, in particular by Judeo Pearl. So that's the physiological level. Supposing you are smoking, those particles enter your lung and at the biology level, control uncontro cause uncontrolled cell duplication. This is enabled by gene regulatory networks. The smoke particles are caused protein production based on the DNA code. This happens through macromolecular chemistry, the regulatory molecules binding and conformational changes causing this protein production. This is based in quantum chemistry of molecules bind to produce macromolecules because of quantum chemistry effects. This is happening because at the atomic physics level, atoms bind to give molecules. That's happened at the particle level because of electron proton interactions. So, my points efficient causation takes place at every case. There is causation taking place at every level. 
the, the causation at every level can be studied and expressed in laws. And if any level was missing, the thing wouldn't work. If you missed the quantum chemistry level, it wouldn't work. If you missed the physiology level, every level is necessary. Causation takes place at every level. It's driven in a downward way. None of this would be taking place unless the advertising took place. You wouldn't be smoking if that didn't, didn't take place. And that stretches all the way down to this level. It's enabled in an upward way. The, the molecules wouldn't bind if the electron and proton interaction was in place. The protein production would be doing this if the molecules are binding. So there's downward causation taking place and upward causation. And the crucial point is that causal closure involves the whole thing. For causation to close, every level must be taken into account. The idea that the physics level is causally closed is simply wrong. That does not the way the real world works. And the, agents, the level of agency and moral responsibility is one of the levels included. In fact, advertising has been changed because moral responsibility forced the advertisers to download, and they now have those warnings on a cigarette pack saying it's dangerous to your health. That's because morality, the environment, act down to the, this level and changed what was going on there. So the last slide, Let's have some biological examples of same level emergence oscillators, the heart, the lungs, resonant circuits in the brain, homeostasis, feedback control, protecting organism from perturbations, metabolism, use of materials and energy for bodily needs, reading genes to produce proteins on the basis of information of DNA, neural networks, predicting and planning. Each has its own emergent logic, which can be demonstrated at that level. Physics per se does not determine them, Biological necessity does. So I've tried to show the big picture whereby biological necessity shapes what happens at all levels. Uh, thanks for um, your talk. Thanks. Yeah, uh, it, 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 I think your talk is very interesting. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a, a question uh, about your uh, content. Um, my, my question is, um, uh, I think uh, most of your um, uh, in, in your talk, the down, downward causations, uh, we can find the direct direct physical mechanism. Um, however, I think in uh, biology or in social systems, um, sometimes the macro level variables uh, cannot directly uh, take effect to the uh, macro uh, level uh, variables. So um, uh, I don't know if you you you, uh, you can give us uh, some examples of, of that kind of emergent uh, downward causation. Look, no, normally it takes place; it changes, it ch changes down. But um, there are cases, there are interesting cases where macro level can reach directly down to the micro level. Now, one case is um, the incredible experiments which quantum physicists have been doing whereby they, um, they uh, manipulate individual atoms, individual molecules. Um, there's a lot of stuff in, you can reach down under certain, certain circumstances from the macro level directly to the micro level. Normally it changes down as the example of smoking and lung cancer, uh, it changes down from one level to the next, down to the next. And a similar example, by the way, is obesity. There's a huge, amount of advertising in many countries promoting junk food, which makes you obese. And that chains down from that uh, economic level in a, in a whole series of steps. So normally it doesn't go direct. It normally goes down uh, through this whole set, step by step down through the emergence levels from the macro level to the micro level. Okay, thank you. And uh, and, and also, I, I have a, another question uh, related with the first one is um, uh, if is if it possible that uh, actually in 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 nowadays, for example, in the human society, actually there is a, a kind of emergent downward uh, causation, but we don't know that. <laughs> I, I I don't know if it is possible. How do you think? So is what possible? Yeah, I, I mean, um, because there are some um, emergent uh, uh, downward causation, right? Yeah. But uh, sometimes uh, we cannot observe the direct mechanism of this kind of causation. So 
uh, I right. guess, yeah, so I guess maybe uh, right now in the human society, uh, there are some uh, downward causation, but uh, we don't know. Oh, yes, yes, I'm, I'm writing a paper at this moment about downward causation in society. And there are, ah. many mechanisms, um, there are many mechanisms by which social mechanisms try to shape how you behave. There are, are, are forces of all kinds, there are roles, there are laws, and so on, whereby society tries to make yeah. you behave the way it wants. And in particular, <laughs> education is one form in which, which I briefly mentioned. The education system is training you how society thinks mm -hmm. you ought to believe. There are roles. A policeman has a role, a doctor has a role, and you learn to expect that role from the doctor and the policeman. If you are a doctor and policeman, you learn from society, this is how I'm supposed to behave and this is how I'm not supposed to behave. So yes, in social institutions, there are many downward mechanisms. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor. Um, and uh, okay, so you can take pause. Okay. So hi, so we are changing in using the same uh, device to escape the aforementioned uh, issues. Okay, so 